Hey there, it's Board Game Dave. Today we're taking a look at a game called Legacy of You from Garfield Games, one of my favorite publishers. They knocked it out of the park with Raiders of the North Sea many years ago with the two lovely expansions. Uh, the West Kingdom trilogy is absolutely fantastic. I love Viscounts. This is my friend Connor's copy. He's been letting me uh, borrow. Of course, they're working on the South Tigris trilogy right now. And now this game, Legacy of You, which is also my friend Connor's copy. So thank you, Connor, so much for letting me borrow and play this amazing game. Legacy of You is a brand new solo only campaign non-linear fully replayable game and I love the idea of a game that's specifically tailored for the solo experience and this game does a tremendous job of being a very satisfying solo game. Uh, it also has tons of mechanisms that I love baked into the game. It's got worker placement, it's got engine building, it's got multi-use cards, it's got resource management, etc. Lots of other mechanisms that just shine and blend so seamlessly together. But all that being said, I still wasn't sold on the game based on the little bit I knew about it from the Kickstarter. But once people started receiving their copies and getting it to the table, people were buzzing and raving about how good of a solo experience this game was, including my friend Connor. So I was instantly intrigued and he said that once he was done with the campaign, he'd let me borrow it. So here I am playing the game nonstop. I've played it 12 times, I think in a row, uh, in less than a week. So needless to say, spoiler alert, I am hooked on this game. I think it's absolutely tremendous. Speaking of spoilers, uh, there might be a card or two that you see, you know, that comes from later on in the campaign, but honestly, there's nothing out here that's going to spoil the game for you, so I'll be very careful not to show you anything, you know, that's that's any kind of spoiler. But let's take a look at the board. I've got it all set up here for my next play, and I will kind of talk you through how this game plays very, very quickly. All right, so in this game, you take on the role of King Yu the Great in ancient China, and your task is to construct canals to prevent these floods that are ravaging your peoples and your lands uh, and you're gonna be building canals down the river here and at the same time kind of fighting off these ignorant barbarians that are impeding your work uh, as you build these canals so that's kind of the premise of the game the way to win the game is to complete all six of these canals and make it to the end of the round. And there's three different ways to lose the game. Either the flood catches up to an unbuilt section of the canal or the flood makes it all the way off the board, okay? So that's one way. Two is that there's seven barbarians out here uh, kind of in that mm, display up at the top. And the third way to lose is taking damage. So sometimes barbarians will make you lose cards from your townsfolk deck. And if you don't have cards to lose, you lose. So. That's the basic premise of the game. And the easiest way I think to teach this game is by just kind of talking through the, the five phases of each round. So uh, here's the round structure. We're going to harvest, we're going to take actions, we're gonna return the barge, we're gonna suffer attacks and refresh the card row. And I love that the back of the rule book is a kind of a player aid with the round structure right there on the side. So let's talk through these steps, okay? Harvest is where you gain resources and cards. So right here you see that this first harvest phase, I've gained four cards from my deck. I got a white worker, a laborer, okay? I got a con shell and I got myself some provisions, all right? So that's my income phase. And you can get more income by tucking townsfolk cards under the board like so, which means during the harvest phase, I'm gonna get more provisions or, you know, more different kinds of workers or wood, other resources like that. So that's uh, one way to increase my harvest. I can also put these farms out on building spaces and that gives me more resources and again, kind of meeples during the harvest phase, okay? Second is where we take action. So this is the main bulk of the game, of course, right? I can take works, I can take actions in several different ways. I can put workers out on these hut spaces to get resources, that's the worker placement part. I can also use my cards in two different ways, or I guess three different ways. One is by tucking the card under the board, again, for that harvest benefit. I can also play a card for the thing that's in the top left. So again, that could be resources, that could be uh, different kinds of you know uh, workers. Uh, red is a fighter, black is a rider, blue is a spearman, and yellow is an archer. And they have specific different things that they do. But anyways, so I can play that into my exhausted pile here to get that resource. Just the thing in the top left corner, by the way. I could also discard the card completely to get the top two things, right? This and that. So, uh, of course, that leaves my deck, which is not good, because again, if our deck runs out, basically we lose the game. So, uh, but in a pinch, you can do that to get more things, right? And then also, I can always be building things. So, 
The build costs are shown here. I can build farms, I can build outposts, I can build huts, and I can start building the canal, which, uh, you know, as you cycle through this deck, the flood comes uh, progressing one space every time you have to shuffle your deck, every time the deck runs out. So it's important that you keep building canals, kind of pacing yourself through that river uh, again, and that is the uh, end game victory condition is that you build all those canals. So uh, let's talk about these other buildings. So we know that farms give us more income during the income phase, the harvest phase, right? Outposts allow you to use workers in various different ways. So the white workers are laborers, right? And that's really important. This doesn't mean any two meeples. It means two white workers, right? And in order to destroy barbarians, which is something you're going to want to do on your turn as well, this one requires two yellow meeples and a black meeple. Well, right now I don't have any, right? But, but by building outposts, uh, not only do I get an extra con shell each time I build an outpost, but also right, putting it out there like this means from now on my white workers, my laborers are the same as the black riders, right? And I can build more like this, perhaps I do something like that. And if I, well, I don't have a space to build this, but if I did, if I had three white meebles, right, they could be basically in essence, two yellows and a black, and then I could destroy this barbarian, okay? So that's how the outposts work. They give you a little bit more flexibility, right? And a little bit more income as well. The huts are pretty straightforward. You pay three brick, uh, a wood and a laborer, and you get to build this hut. Now there's something on the back I'm not gonna look at, you know, uh, but there's something on the back I'll receive as well. And that opens up a new worker placement spot. So I could go here and turn my white labor into meeple of any color. So I could turn it into a spearman, for example, right? So that's how those work. And there's various other worker placement spots there. Okay? At the end of the round, by the way, those workers come back. So it's not like a permanent thing. So that can be very helpful as well. Oh, and by doing that, you open up another space where you can tuck further cards. So again, that's another way you can kind of build up your engine. So there's a lot of ways to do that uh, along the way, right? Speaking of building, building canals, uh, again, requires these things right here. When you do that, you'll remove your barge. You can only do that once per round. You'll receive what's at the bottom. Oftentimes you'll have to discard cards from your town's folk deck as well. And once it comes off, you have a new trade you can do, right? So getting those conch shells allows you to kind of uh, get provisions or wood or stone, or sorry, or uh, brick. And later on you can trade it for uh, discarding cards for conch shells, and then you can trade for different kinds of meeples. Here you can get uh, a laborer for four conch shells, so on and so forth. And they kind of get better as you go left to right. So that's building the canal, right? On your turn, you can also interact with townsfolk cards up here at the top. Uh, each one kind of has a cost right there to interact with. Uh, these are provision costs. I can either take the card, pay the provision cost like this one. I would pay one provision and either take this card into my exhausted pile where it will cycle back into my deck or I can remove it from the game, put it in the discard pile to get those two things. In, in this case, uh, the two provisions in the top left. Okay, just that part right there. So those are the two things I can do with those townsfolk cards. And finally, barbarians. Again, I'd have to pay the provision costs and then pay those color meeples, I get the reward and we remove the barbarian from the uh, display there. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the actions you'll be doing on your turn. Now let's talk about the next phase, which is suffering attacks and then refreshing the card room. So let's say that I didn't attack this barbarian, right? At the end of my actions, all the barbarians that are out here are going to attack. Now, uh, this barbarian is going to make me either uh, discard a card from the top of my deck or lose a white meeple. So let's say maybe I had one I could spare. I would be basically bribing the barbarian, return that to the supply, and it's not going to attack my cards. Or again, I get rid of the top card of my deck. All right. After we suffer attacks, we're going to refresh the card row. And this is how this works. So let's say maybe I'd uh, added this to my uh, supply. Maybe I discarded her for the provisions like so. All right. First thing that happens is the townsfolk move off to the side and then we're going to add new barbarians and you're going to know how many barbarians to add by these red icons here, right? Every other canal is going to uh, reveal another one of those icons, which means you're going to add more and more barbarians as you progress throughout the game. But for right now, I just need to add one barbarian. So I would slide her over, right? And I would flip a new barbarian now 
I won't do that for right now, but a new barbarian would show up there. And then any spaces left, I replace with another townsfolk, right? And that's all you have to do. That's refreshing the card room. And this is where you might end up with seven barbarians out here in the display and you lose, right? So that can happen as well. Once you refresh the card row, you're back to the beginning of the round. Do your harvest, take your actions, so on and so forth. Oh, I forgot that the barge comes back to the next space of the canal if you've built the canal on the previous turn. Oh, I should mention, of course, the story element of this game, which is such a huge part of the game. Along the way, sometimes you'll see icons like this, this golden turtle. And that means to go to the storybook and turn to that specific chapter, right? And uh, again, don't, don't look too much if you're trying not to see any spoilers, but in this case, I'd go to 47, right? And I'd read what it says. So 47 right here. I read the story and then it's gonna tell me what to do. Typically, you'll remove this card from the game. You'll stick it in the history uh, pile. And then usually you're gonna go to this separate stack. This is 69 cards in this deck. You'll find a specific number and you'll put that card either in the Barbarian deck or it'll be like a skill card that gives you a permanent ongoing ability or it'll be a townsfolk card that you put into your deck or a hut or something like that. So throughout the course of the game, you're going to be adding tons of new cards into the game that's going to change the game a lot. So each game feels completely different as you interact with things that kind of progress the story along. And there's a lot of things in this storybook. I mean, I assume 69, maybe there's more or less looks like 53 different things that'll happen throughout the course of the game, and you won't see all of it. They say that you'll see 40 to 60% of the game in one campaign. So you could just reset it, go back to the beginning, start from scratch, and have a completely different, again, branching non-linear journey through this game. And that's basically what you'll be doing in Legacy of You. Now, that was a very fast kind of frantic, hectic overview, of course. Um, if you want a more slower paced how to play guide, of course, there's many videos of that on YouTube already. But for right now, let's take a look at my seven criteria for how I rate games, and we'll see how this game scores in each of those seven categories. First, let's talk about the art and components. I am absolutely love the artwork in this game. The art is by Sam Phillips, Shem's brother, I believe, and I love this style. I'll go ahead and flip through these Townsfolk cards for you. Uh, there's so many unique Townsfolk cards with great art. I love the way they portray these amazingly uh, rugged and handsome and beautiful uh, Chinese Townsfolk. It's so great. These, there's so much personality kind of drawn into these cards. I love the graphic design, the component quality, the cards themselves are really nice stock. I love the way they feel. We've got these wooden wave and barge meeples. Uh, the buildings are fantastic. There's uh, wood and bricks in here that are really nice wooden pieces. The meeples themselves are great, great colors, easy to differentiate. This insert is lovely as well. It's one of the best things about this game is this insert keeps everything organized. I will say that the cardboard conch shell and the provisions are nice. You know, they're, they're fine, thick cardboard, but I wish there was some way to upgrade those. Like even on the Kickstarter, there wasn't a option for upgrading your provisions and uh, conch shells. And as somebody who kind of wages war against cardboard, board components, I would have loved to see the option to upgrade those things. Because even though this is not my game, I would have happily spent you know, maybe $10, $15 for a conch shell provision upgrade pack, but maybe that's just me. So overall, I love the art and components. I'm gonna give it a nine and a half out of 10 again, just because there was no uh, way to upgrade those cardboard components. Second is complexity versus audience. And I'm gonna give the game a 9.5 here. The game is weighted at 2.79 out of five on BGG. And I think that's so great for like a mid-weight solo game. The rule book is very, very small. It's very intuitive. It's very easy to learn and remember from game to game if you kind of have a break between solo sessions. Uh, the only reason I'm giving it a 9.5 is because uh, based on Garfield Games' other games like the South Tiger series, like Viscounts, like Paladins, like Architects, uh, people might be expecting perhaps a more complex game. So maybe some people are going to be disappointed at uh, maybe how simple the game is, although I think that it's got plenty of depth. So uh, I won't give it a 10 here only because some people's expectations might be a little bit uh, more on the heavy your side. Third is thematic integration. And I think that the game does a great job with this, especially with this storybook, by the way, which is so well written. I love the style of writing in this game as it progresses the story forward. And it all kind of fuses into this story, which is again, based uh, in historic fact, by the way, where, you know, I've got to build these canals because the flood is coming and here I go working my way down and, and the flood is catching up and I'm putting buildings out on these new spaces that are opened up by canals and, uh, uh, you know, recruiting townsfolk 
folk to the cause. That's my townsfolk deck. Barbarians are coming out. They're becoming stronger as the canal gets, uh, you know, uh, built more and more progressively and they're attacking my townsfolk. And, you know, uh, the story of the game, right? As you add new cards, you'll get like a potter that's gonna help you get more bricks or you'll realize that someone's stealing food from your provision store. So you have to go on this like sort of tiny little side quest to kind of figure out who's been stealing from the food stores. and. It's just great. And again, I think the storybook does a lot of heavy lifting to keep the game thematic because, you know, sure, at the end of the day, I'm just moving wooden pieces around. But with the storybook, you feel like there's this sense of tension and push and pull and narrative driving through the game. So 9.5 out of 10. I think there's so much theme baked uh, and woven into this game. And I really love the narrative story element of it. Fourth is intuitive mechanics. And this game is practically perfect in this way. I love the, the small rule set. I love the player aid back here on the back to help you remember the phases and the different icons. Now, your first play, you might, you know, have to check the rulebook for a few small things like, you know, you can build farms and outposts in any order, but huts have to go from left to right. Or maybe like the way that you refresh the card row can be a little bit funky the first, you know, few plays. But honestly, once you've played it one or two times, everything is so easy. I never check the rulebook for anything anymore because it's so intuitive. And there's not many games I can say that about because I am a huge rules stickler. So, you know, if, even if I'm 99% sure about something, I'm checking the rulebook. But for this game, everything makes sense. It's intuitive. I love it. I mean, I could put this game away, I'm sure for like four months, come back, jump right in, don't have to check the rule book because everything just makes sense. It's a 10 out of 10 for intuitive mechanics. Next is replayability. And in talking about this, we kind of have to talk about what we mean by replayability. So I've played this game 12 times this week and I'm really looking forward to playing it again and getting to the end of this campaign. I, I find the replayability very, very high. Pretty much every game as you, so, let me show you something really quick. This is my history deck. So these are all the things that I've encountered throughout the course of the game so far in those, well, 10 games in this scenario. So uh, these are the things that I've interacted with and each one changes the game. So, you know, as long as you're, you know, completing objectives and finishing canals and reading things from the storybook, your game is gonna change every time. And that really helps with that replayability element. Now, that being said, once I finish the campaign, which by the way, the campaign ends when you either win seven games or lose seven games. So right now I'm at, I'm at five, five. So there's gonna be two or three more games until the campaign is completely finished. At that point, do I wanna replay the game, start all over? You know, I, I would say that I definitely want to. I, I'm probably gonna end up giving the game back to Connor, but you know, after what would that be? 12 to 13 plays to wanna to play it even more and start the scenario all over again, that is really speaking a lot for this game. I mean, honestly, there's many games in my collection that I have not played, you know, 12 times. So as far as replayability goes, that's a 10 out of 10. You know, I, it, it keeps you coming back each time you end the game. Oh, and my goodness, each time you end a game, you're gonna either read a victory card or a defeat card based on whether you won or lost. And that'll kind of give you uh, something to change about your next game. And typically the way it works is if you win a game, it's gonna give you a challenge, something you have to complete, something to make the game harder the next game. If you lose, it'll give you a small buff, something to kind of help you uh, with the next game. And I love the way that the game game kind of levels itself itself out for you. It's like a self-balancing thing where, you know, the game's never going to be too hard and it's never going to be too easy. That is absolutely brilliant. I love that system. And again, really helps with replayability. So 10 out of 10, such a replayable game for me. Sixth is the length and fun factor. So this game takes me about 50 to 60 minutes to play on average. And I think that's a fantastic play time for a solo game, right? I don't want to sit and play a solo game for three and a half hours, but I also don't want like a 12 minute filler solo game either. And this, you know, just about one hour game is a perfect length for solo plays. And one big thing with solo gaming is like the setup and teardown time, because it's it's just not super fun to sell, set up a game for, you know, 20 minutes for a solo game. I mean, I, I just want to set up a game and get going right away. And I will tell you, Legacy of You is one of the easiest games to set up and put away. So first of all, this insert is absolutely amazing. It tells you exactly where everything goes. And that's really helpful because in a campaign game like this, you know, you have to kind of uh, trash cards, basically. You need, you know, ongoing cards here, story cards here, uh, new cards to reveal over here, right? And that keeps everything organized and it's labeled here. Plus, you know, my resources go here, my meeples go here, my buildings go there. 
uh, I just leave this by the board and then I can use this as my organizer throughout the course of the game. At the end of the game, you take your town's full cards, uh, shuffle them back up, take your barbarians, shuffle them back up. Everything else just goes back in the box where it came from, close the lid, you're ready to go. And if you're trying to do back-to-back -back sessions of this game, it's so easy. I mean, honestly, I think in five minutes, you know, when I end a game, I could shuffle things, get some new cards out, boom, five minutes, I'm ready for the next game. That's awesome. That And that helps with that length and fun factor thing too. So I give it a 10 out of 10. This is a great length. It's easy to set up. It's easy to tear down. It's so easy to get to the table. And that's huge for a solo gamer like me. And finally, let's talk about the cost versus the value. So this game, I think was going for $44 on Kickstarter plus shipping. I think right now it's around $42 some places. I, to be honest, I think that is a little bit high. Now, it might go down. This is still a brand new game, so that price might drop uh, going forward, but you know, it is a solo game, so there's not as much um, you know, player count variability here. It's just for the solo experience. And I will say, by the way, this is worth pointing out, uh, a game like Viscounts, I think you can get this right now for $42. This game is like so heavy. There's so much inside here. Let me just, I wonder if I can open this without crushing anything on the board here. Sorry, Connor, let me take a look here. So go ahead and take a look at this game. There is so much inside Viscounts, right? This is a what, one to four player game, I think. So you got all these meeples, all these resources. You got your tomes, you've got these deck cards, you have the board, you have a castle, you have, you know, your Viscount meeple and all these things for each player and tons of cards. You know, just component wise, there's so much inside this box. And Viscounts, I think is going for $42 right now. Uh, give or take. So pretty much the same cost as uh, Legacy of You. Now, let's take a look at this box. Same size box, right? With a lot fewer components, right? Not as many cards, not as many meeples, not as many resources. Now, of course, that's because it's a solo game, but uh, I have seen online that some people, uh, I don't know if they're complaining, but they're just kind of pointing out that there's a lot of empty space inside. Can I take this out? Yeah, inside this box. So if that concerns you, you know, just something worth noting that, you know, you're paying the same amount as some of these big box Garfield games for, I shouldn't say big box, small, medium sized box Garfield games, and it doesn't come with as much. But on the other side, the gaming experience that's inside this box, especially for solo gamers out there, is extraordinary. So. It's a bit on the pricey side. I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10 for cost versus value because there's a lot of bang for your buck here with the game, with the replayability. But, you know, component wise, there's not that much in the box. And there you have it. Legacy of You gets a staggering 9.64 out of 10 as a final score, which is supremely high, at least for my uh, scale. The only game that got higher than that was Endless Winter. And that was before I had gotten a copy. That was kind of like a preview score. So Legacy of You is absolutely phenomenal. It's a tremendous game. I've had people asking me on Instagram where I've been raving about this game all week, by the way. Uh, I've had people message me and be like, hey, you know, I'm not a big solo gamer. I don't really solo game. Do you think I should try Legacy of You? And I say absolutely you should. If you have somebody that would be willing to lend you a copy like I have come um, you should definitely give it a try. You might be sold on the solo gaming experience with this game. I mean, it's there's something so satisfying and zen about, you know, just playing a game solo and, and having this objective of completing the canals. You know, it's not a beat your own score. You have this actual objective uh, of finishing the canals and beating barbarians and kind of fulfilling your destiny as this great canal builder in ancient China. And I love the way the game evolves and the, the branching storylines. There's so much to love about this game. So I'm a, I'm a huge Legacy of You fanboy. This, I'll go one step further. I think this is my favorite solo game. Uh, I really, really do. I, I have been saying that it's Feast for Odin. Where is it? I don't know where my Feast for Odin is. It's over there, I think. Um, I've been saying that's my favorite solo game for a long time. And if I want a big, you know, heavier Euro experience, I suppose uh, it still is. But as far as just objectively, what game do I want to kind of set out on the table and get playing right now? It's Legacy of You. This game really, really is something very special. And I'm so lucky that I got a chance to try this game out. And I hope that you do too. Uh, they do mention in the rule book, by the way, that once you finish the campaign, it's really easy to reset it back to zero. And it even says somewhere toward the end here, which I thought was really, really cool. Uh, it says that you can, oh, I don't know where it says it, but uh, give the game to a friend or let somebody else borrow it because you can reset it, nothing's permanent. And then they can just ex uh, enjoy the experience and have their own you know, campaign narrative story from scratch. So 
Anyway, I love that. Yeah, here it is. Uh, Legacy of You is completely resettable. This allows you to play through multiple campaigns or to share the game with a friend to enjoy. And what a cool thing in a rule book, by the way. Uh, you know, they could just be trying to sell more copies, but they say, you know, finish the campaign, then let a friend try. I think that's very, very, very cool. I mean, what a cool company. Great designers, great artwork, great, um, you know, narrative story writers. <sighs> Yeah, I knew this was going to be a rambling, uh, you know, gushing, praising review, and I hope it wasn't over the top for you. I know some people think that, uh, you know, I just rave about every game, but I like talking about the games that I love, and Legacy of Game, Legacy of Game, Legacy of You is one that I truly, truly love. Uh, this is just an extraordinary game. So, anyways, check it out, get it played if you can, and uh, yeah, and, and check out other Garfield games. They're, they're, they're fantastic games. So, anyways, oh my goodness, I've been raving and, and ranting long enough. I hope you have a wonderful week. Take care and happy gaming. See ya.